If reading were a religion, the New York Public Library would be its cathedral. Now celebrating its 125th birthday, the NYPL is America's largest public library system, serving more than 17 million people every year and millions more online. It's managed to adapt to an ever-changing audience as the world shifts its focus towards the World Wide Web. In this episode of Influencers, I speak with Tony Marks, CEO of the New York Public Library, as he works to keep people connected and offer an escape during this challenging time in our lives. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Tony Marks, the CEO of the New York Public Library. Tony, nice to see you. It's great to be with you, Andy, as always. Well, I guess I should start off by asking you what the New York Public Library is doing during the coronavirus. Well, uh, we closed physically uh, just a couple days before the schools, um, but we've been preparing for this so that we could operate you know, remotely, uh, paying folks, health insurance, all the things we need to take care of. Uh, so safety first. Um, the good news is, you know, the New York Public Library has the most used library in the world. And, you know, we get the public libraries of New York get 40 million physical visits, or at least they used to uh, a year. Um, but we'd spent the last decade or more really investing in digital, in ebooks and in, in programs online. Uh, on all kinds of offerings. So we were actually in, you know, a really good position for this totally unexpected moment. Um, and, uh, and we've seen the results of that in terms of the use of, of what we're offering online, which has just been terrific. Yeah, when did you realize that you had to close, Tony? What was that decision like? Uh, so it was the same week that everybody was sort of suddenly realizing that this thing that we somehow managed to sort of ignore as it moved across the world. Looking back now, it's sort of amazing. Um, and, um, uh, you know, by the 12th uh, or the third, by the 12th of March, which was a Thursday, we concluded that Friday should be our last day open. Uh, and, um, and we got ready for that. And then um, uh, the mayor uh, was still unsure about uh, closing schools, but he did by the following Monday. Right. Yeah. I mean, the mayor wanted you to keep the libraries open at that point, right? Uh, yes, he did. And Brooklyn and Queens kept their libraries open, but we decided uh, to close. And, you know, we were a couple days ahead of uh, where everybody landed. So what's the process been like sort of transitioning to a digital only library? Well, look, again, we're in good we're in a good position. We've got a chief digital officer who we got stole from the BBC, who's uh, brilliant and terrific. Uh, we've got about 40 people in our digital um, department. That's probably more than maybe all other libraries in the world combined. I mean, it's it's really a, a, a astonishing. And, you know, we've invested millions of dollars, our own money and donors money. Um, uh, so the big, the marquee of that is in eBooks. So we have an app called Simply E. You can download it now. You can also get a library card that way uh, if you don't already have one. And you'll find there uh, about uh, three or four hundred thousand books. Um, we keep working with the publishers and, and others to add to those numbers. Um, and anyone can download them and read them on your phone, on your computer. Um, and in the first week of closing, we saw the um, usage of Simply E go up by almost 700%. Um, now it's sort of leveled since then, um, but you know we've um, we also saw twice as many checkouts of eBooks. Again, people didn't have an option, and you know we've been working on this thing for years. In fact, there are a thousand other libraries in America. We hope eventually all libraries in America are using this app. And we need to keep adding to the books in the collection. And this is this crisis is an opportunity for us to do more of that. So we're we're working at it. 
And you have a program for students, right, called Brain Fuse, and, and what does that entail? Right, so Brain Fuse, uh, so we have uh, a great new, uh, the Tisch director of, uh, of the branches and, uh, and education uh, came to us from being the chief executive uh, and commissioner of libraries in Chicago, the third biggest system in the country. Brian Bannon is, you know, is fantastic at what he does. And he had used this uh, thing called Brain Fuse, which uh, we, you know, pay. And then, you know, the public, public school students, any student can get one-to-one -one online tutoring. Um, and again, that has, of course, exploded in use. But again, that's, you know, only one, you know, example. We, um, we've worked with ProQuest and others to make sure that our, uh, our databases, which you previously could only access in the buildings, now is available to you at home. Um, we're doing virtual story time because, you know, we usually see about a million kids in story time, uh, you know, million visits of kids to story time in the branches, just reading to them uh, and their caregivers or parents. Uh, we get a million of those a year. And now we're shifting those online and doing virtual story times. We're doing virtual book clubs. Um, we, um, we're working with WNYC, partnering with them uh, to help publicize that and, and work on the same books. I mean, you know, and that's just a, just a few examples of what's happening, uh, really exploding in use online. Um, you know, we, um, we were ready for this, but no one could anticipate why we would need this so dramatically now. My guess is the world isn't going to be the same after this, Andy. You know, people are going to get used to doing things online. People are going to get used to, you know, meeting online. Um, it's not going to be the same when this is done. And, you know, although we're all eager for it to be done, whatever that means at this point. Right. I know. Speaking of that book club that you mentioned, Tony, I think that what Michelle Obama's book was the most popular. And then, of course, she's been visible during this time reading to kids online as well. Right. She's she's been terrific. We had we had partnered with uh, the first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, um, uh, when she was when they were uh, in the White House on a, something called Open eBooks, where we got uh, uh, great books donated by all the major publishers for free, and available online for any student who qualified for free lunch, which is one of the ways we measure poverty in this country. Um, that that was uh, that worked, uh, but it sort of went dormant. We are now talking about how to revive it, and of course, we'll be talking to Michelle Obama about it as well, since it was her uh, it was her brainchild originally. So, three hundred thousand students in New York uh, lack equipment to do online uh, schooling or schooling at home, and the city's trying to get them iPads. Are you concerned about this inequity, and is there a place for the New York Public Library to play? <laughs> Well, uh, Andy, you know that um, we were focused on this issue uh, for a very long time. Um, this is part of the digital divide. It's not all of it. And you need to be trained in how to use it. You know, there are all kinds of other. And we offer, we're the biggest computer skills training uh, in New York. We've been doing that in person. Now we're shifting to figure out how to do more of that online. Um, but we, we understood right uh, long ago um, uh, I'll tell you a story. The, um, I left a branch in the Bronx one beautiful fall day. It was the branch had just closed. And there was a kid sitting on the stoop with the oldest computer I'd ever seen. This was years ago. And I said, you know, what are you doing? And he said, my math homework. It's online. It's assigned. I said, that's great. And he said, why are you sitting here? And he said, because we can't afford broadband at home. So I get the bleed out of the library. And I thought, in the 21st century, in New York City, kids are getting digital crumbs under the door from the library when it's closed. You know, I went back, I uh, looked it up, I was shocked to find that at least 2 million New Yorkers are in the digital dark, um, do not have adequate broadband uh, access at home. We, um, we started uh, lending hotspots, which are these MiFi devices. Um, I think we started at 10,000 with support from Google and others. Then we discovered that there was a federal program that would pay the subscription fees for this. 
uh, again, to free lunch students in public school. Uh, I asked the chancellor. Chancellor said, yes, we can't use it, though, because we can't afford the $50 little box that makes it work. So we said, fine, we'll take care of the box. You got the subscription through the feds. And I think we got that they got up to 30 or 40,000. That's great. But it's a drop in the bucket if it's two million people. And today, under these circumstances, we see just how tragic the digital divide is in this country. I mean, literally cut off from doing any of the things that people need to be able to do, uh, want to be able to do. We um, we uh, we did. We were delighted uh, to work with the city. They've uh, purchased 300,000 iPads uh, during this crisis. We've uh, to give those to public school students, who, and including uh, full data. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, we downloaded the Simply E app, so the circulating library, as well as BrainFuse and our other educational programs onto those. There is still a gap here. And, you know, I think this experience, one of the lessons, one of the many lessons, I hope, is that we've got to solve this thing. We've got to talk to the ISPs, to the providers, try to figure out how we can offer everyone a minimum almost sort of utility level of connectivity. Uh, you can still pay your provider for premium services, but we're going to have to find a way to get everyone uh, hooked up because this is the world we live in and we can't leave people in the dark. We, kids can't even do their homework now. They can't participate in online learning. This is crazy. We've got to get at this. We should have gotten at it before. We tried, um, but it's time now. It's kind of interesting. I mean, is this in your job description, Tony? Is this part of your purview to make sure that the school children in New York City have Internet? Um, well, look, where the library is, you know, people think libraries are in the book storage and, and lending business. And we are. But that's not the business we we're in. We're in the access to information business. We're in the enabling people to learn, to gain skills, to read, to, you know, escape through reading, whatever it is they want to do. Um, we're the store, we, we are the storehouse of accumulated human knowledge, much more than Google, because we've got all the books, which Google does not. We've got all that content. And, you know, and we have proudly said to the world, come to the library and we'll lend it to you. But now we can do that online. And literally, we can say to anyone, whether it's, you know, the kid in Harlem or, you know, the farmer in Kenya, eventually, you know, it should all be available to everyone. And we see that now in a way that, you know, that we didn't before. It's because access to information is what our job is. If people are going to gain that access online, and the impediment is they can't afford the connection or the device, then yes, the library needs to play a role in forcing that issue and finding a solution. And we were doing that and now we're doing it double time. Yeah, I don't know if people know the scale of your organization, Tony, but my understanding is you're the second largest library in the United States after the Library of Congress. So leaving that aside, you'd be number one. Over 50 million items, including mostly books, I guess, and over 90 locations. Um, how do you oversee something that large? <laughs> uh, well, Andy, you know, before this, I ran a, a, a wonderful, sweet little college. Um, so and, and didn't have city politics and didn't have New York City and all the rest of it. Um, look, it's, it's a challenge. The, the, the real answer to that question, Andy, is I have an all star team. Um, I mean, just, you know, remarkable folks, uh, chief operating officer who was vice chancellor at CUNY, as well as um, commissioner of transportation for Bloomberg. Uh, Brian Bannon, I mentioned, who came to us from the Chicago library system, the third biggest system. Um, we've got uh, Bill Kelly running uh, the research libraries. He was the you know, transformative president of the CUNY Graduate Center and then interim chancellor of the whole CUNY system. Tony Age, I mentioned chief digital officer. 
and Carrie Welsh in external relations and, and a great uh, Michelle Mays as general counsel. I've got an amazing team. Um, and now, you know, in these in these unexpected crisis moments, and this one is, you know, sort of, uh, you know, historic. I mean, this one is uh, really going to be for the record books. Um, that's when you see the power of, you know, having invested in great talent, um, as well as having invested in things like digital, which seemed a little far-fetched when we started doing it. And now, obviously, everyone understands why it's so essential. Right. Speaking of your team, and not only the top people, but everyone who works for your, for your organization, how are they faring? And are you having to furlough, cut pay, lay people off? What's the status of the employees? So we, um, so we have not uh, furloughed or laid off anyone um, at this juncture. Um, look, we're, it's this is complicated, uh, so I'll try to explain it. Um, so we are, uh, as you said, we're the second biggest library in the country after, in terms of numbers of books, because the Library of Congress gets every book for free. That we would like that, but we don't. We're not a national deposit library. The right. um, uh, but 55 billion isn't bad. Um, we're the most, probably the most used library in the world, right? Just in terms of visits, physical and online. And that's totally appropriate for New York's library, right? Um, uh, we, um, we are a private foundation. I'm the president of the Astor, Lennox and Tilden Trust that operates the New York public libraries for the city, but not as a city agency. Our operating budget was about $360 million a year, and we had about almost a billion dollars of capital work going on, record setting. You know, hats off to Iris Weinschel as well as that whole team. Really, we've been fixing things up at a clip, which again was good timing, though we've had to pause on some of those projects. But um, we get about $200 million, or we're getting $200 million out of 360 of operating from the city. Um, the city hasn't, you know, we took a minor uh, pe peg, a cut uh, now, we, we could do that. But basically, because we're not dependent, we don't charge anybody for anything. So we didn't get hit by the first wave of lost revenue, which is lost gate, right? We, we, yep. we, don't, have, we don't have any gate. We don't charge anybody for anything. Um, well, proudly so. Um, so that meant we didn't take the original hit and we had city money from the budget in. We were doing very well on fundraising. This is our 125th anniversary. So we've really been working hard on that. But of course, all that is, you know, has sort of come to a, a, a pause or a halt at this point. Um, so, you know, we don't know what lies ahead. It seems hard to uh, imagine that there won't be serious cuts in the city's budget as you know the feds figure out what they can do to support. And then as we see the revenue drop, we, we know from 2007 to nine that the library hit bottom of the effect of the Great Recession two years after, so in 09. Um, so we just know these things work through the city's budget cycle. Unfortunately, all of our revenue um, sources uh, are sort of, you know, uh, cycled together, right? So, you know, the city's revenues are going to go down. Therefore, you know, access to resources, available resources to the library may very well go down. Though so far, the mayor has protected us, which is great. Um, and we're grateful. But the, um, you know, do private donations will go down at the same time. The endowment draw, because of the value of the endowment, with a, a slight, you know, pause. It, it takes a year or two to catch up in our formula, but that will go down. Our shop, our events, our rentals, all of that, right? It's all going to, you know, sort of decrease together and we're going to have some very hard choices to make uh, in the months ahead. Is there any talk yet of reopening any of the branches? Would you do it in stages? What's the thinking, Tony? Well, look, since we we closed, you know, uh, you know, uh, early um, to sort of, you know, try to move the system towards that, towards the city, towards that. And which just felt like the sa the right thing to do in terms of safety of folks. Um, opening is going to be a lot messier, Andy. Um, uh, you know, for everybody. Um, you know, we're not going to have a vaccine or a cure for some period of time. God willing, we will have it, and hopefully sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, you know, 
because we also don't have testing, which is sort of the basic thing you need to do. I mean, look at what Europe is doing. Look at all the success cases. It's all based on testing so that you can figure out who needs to be cared for and who can go back to work. Otherwise, everyone's going to be scared. There'll be reinfections, you know, waves will go back to, you know, isolation. You know, this is going to be messy. Um, so we're going to be very thoughtful and very careful where, you know, we are, of course, talking about scenarios. We don't know when this will happen. July, who, who knows, right? You know, we know that kids are going to be eager to sort of get out of the house, but also, you know, catch up on their schoolwork. They may not have camps this year. Uh, there's, you know, less employment opportunities, obviously. Um, you know, so we'll be under some pressure, I imagine, to open. And we'll be working with the city and being very mindful of public safety and staff safety. And we'll probably do it gradually so we can learn as we go, right? This is a new world. So, you know, we may not be able to open. We, I, I don't think we could open all of our facilities, nor do I think we should instantly. Let's open a few. Let's learn and see how it goes. That's true in the branches. It's also true in the research library. So the great library on 42nd Street, as well as the Library for Performing Arts at Lincoln Center and the Schomburg at Harlem. Um, you know, so, and there are some things we also know are more pressing to start. So we have uh, the Science, Industry, and Business Library, which we were about to move from 34th Street to 40th Street. That facility will be ready sooner than other parts of the new New Arcos Library, previously known as the Mid-Manhattan, for those of us who use it at high school. Um, but um, so the, the business library, we may need to try to find a way to open sooner because it's where people get advice on starting a business, on saving a business, on taxes. We're doing that all online, including one-on-one -on -one business advisories, um, as well as webinars, all the things you might imagine. But you know, we know there's going to be great demand for this because the economic you know, impact of what we are currently living through is going to be with us for a while. Are libraries around the country all closed or some of them open? And should they all be closed? Should President Trump have ordered them all closed? If some of them. <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, I have not heard of a library that is still open. Uh, that, you know, there are 16,500 of them in America, which is more than there is Starbucks. Um, <laughs> just, um, though, you know, Starbucks, you know, may need to adjust its strategy going forward as well. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if there's some uh, of that 16,500, America's a beautiful big country. It's possible there's one open so far somewhere. I just haven't heard about it. Are you communicating with other library heads in terms of what's going on during the crisis? Sure. We, we, uh, we, you know, we, we talk to our colleagues. Uh, Brian, as you can imagine, uh, is totally wired in that community. I, he is a professional librarian. I am not. I'm a I once was a political science professor who uh, found himself in administration. Um, uh, so yes, and you know, they're also the American Library Association, the IMLS is a federal agency, you know, and we're looking for like, you know, some simple, like for instance, how long can the virus live on paper or any other element of a book? Because you know, we may need to quarantine our books for that long to make sure that we're not passing germs from one person to another. That's a that's something that, you know, the experts in the world of libraries and science are going to have to tell us. Just one small example, right? Right. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. And I want to ask you about um, higher education, colleges and universities, because, as you mentioned, you were the president well, I guess I could mention the name of it. It's Amherst College. Uh, <laughs> Amherst, uh, and, I, you know, I don't know how much thought you've given to this now that you're not in this field anymore. But, boy, that's another tough thing to manage right now is the colleges and universities. And they've been closed, obviously. But now you're looking at the fall semester. Have you given any thought to what's going on in that world? Yeah, I have. And it's not pretty. I mean, it's hard to find a pretty picture at the moment anywhere. I think we're all under experiencing that and experiencing a greater sense of uncertainty than I think I've ever felt in my life on, a, on the macro scale, right? Um, and that's just very hard, you know. 
oh my God, New Yorkers, we're used to being totally in control. Sorry, the, um, your question on higher ed. So for instance, you know, I, I know that places like Amherst, which are lucky to have a significant endowment, will have taken a serious hit on that. Um, certainly places that are tuition dependent, right? So the, the, our key revenue source is the tuition that students pay. That could be in jeopardy. Um, they, you know, it's unclear whether universities and colleges will be able to open come the fall physically. Um, without that, it may um, it may be that you know it'll be online, and then students may say, I'll, "I think I'll take a year off rather than spending fifty thousand dollars to do online. I'll wait till it comes back to a semblance of of normal." Um, uh, so that's another hit. But I, I will tell you, I think the greater concern for me, and I, I worried about this before the pandemic, but I worry about it even more now, is, you know, as, you know, I think it will be very tempting, for instance, for state legislators to say, this online learning seems to have worked very well. Why are we paying for, you know, running a state university, a flagship, you know, state university? Let's just go online. It's much cheaper. Um, and the vast majority of folks who do go to college or attend it even virtually will be sort of left to do it virtually, remotely. A lot of those kids are going to have trouble or and adults going to have trouble because they may need help and, and virtual doesn't work so well when you need help uh, as well as in person. And, uh, you know, the Harvards of the world, well endowed, you know, they'll stay, they'll be protected by their wealth, by their supporters. Um, and a tiny slice of American elite will go to those kinds of places. And the bifurcation that we see in the economy will be replicated even further than it already is in higher education. And I worry that this experience of online is going to sort of exacerbate that. Right. Um, did you ever imagine as a kid growing up in Inwood in a neighborhood in New York City that you would be running the library? I did not. I used to use the yeah. library in Inwood. And um, in fact, we have uh, renovation plans there um, that uh, include a brand new library for, for my old neighborhood, coincidentally. And interestingly, I think 175 units of affordable housing in the air above it, because libraries never used the air above them. And New York needs affordable housing. Um, so, um, you know, I, but I never imagined this, of course not. Uh, you know, I never even thought about working for the library. I was, you know, uh, happily at Amherst and the um, library came a calling, but it's, it's an amazing fit for me, Andy. I mean, you know, the power of New York is its diversity, but we tend to live before this moment even in isolated or gated sort of parts of it. My job takes me to the poorest neighborhoods, to the South Bronx, to Harlem, uh, to Staten Island, uh, takes me to you know the homes of some of the richest citizens in New York who are supporters of the library, uh, to City Hall, I mean, to all of it, and that's fabulous. And even before this, uh, this happened, um, it was true that the library was sort of surprisingly, almost uniquely equipped to be able to transform itself as necessary. You know, we don't have a faculty or a teacher's union or regulations, all the things that have various, you know, you know importance, but we don't have those. So right. that, you know, when we decided years ago that we needed to become not just a passive space, but also a proactive education space, we built education programs, two million visits to those at the moment or until a month ago. Now we're going to have to rethink what that means, right? Uh, right? But we could transform or all the digital investments that now are paying off so mightily, right? Right, right. Our two last quick questions, Tony. First of all, how are patience and fortitude faring during the coronavirus? I mean, after well, all I walk by them. I walk by them on nice days uh, when I can, and um, they, they seem to be fine. Um, so just a reminder, uh, it was Fiora LaGuardia that named them Patience and Fortitude. These are the two um, lions in the, the front. The lions, lions in front, sorry. Um, 
and uh, you know, probably the most famous imagery of a library and, and one of the most famous images in the world. Um, and that's great. Um, we, um, you know, he, Fiorello LaGuardia named them Patients of Fortitude during the Depression, as I recall. Um, and it's because he knew that that's what New Yorkers needed to get through. And uh, that is still the case. So we're getting a lot of attention to Patients of Fortitude. Yes. By the way, just to make it weird, it turns out the sculptor who designed Patients of Fortitude was an Amherst grad. But oh, who knew? Well, no need <laughs> to mention that, but you did anyway. <laughs> Uh, and then final question, what does the CEO of the New York Public Library read during a shelter in place situation? I spend a couple hours a day on the New York Times and other news, at least, you know, I'm just, you know, trying to understand like the rest of us. I spend most of the day on Zoom and reading emails, Andy. Um, when I have time to read, I'm trying to make it through Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain which is a little, I always thought was perfect if I ever got locked away for weeks, but it's a little more depressing than I might actually like under these settings. <laughs> I love that book, but it, it is pretty heavy. On the other hand, it's certainly <laughs> apropos right now. Right. Yes, it is. All right. Andy, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Tony Mark, CEO of the New York Public Library. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And everybody keep safe and use the library. We're here for you. I'm Andy Serwer. You've been watching Influencers. We'll see you next time.